All right, welcome everybody. Sorry for that rude interruption, uh, but at least we all got a little bit warmed up. Uh, my name is Susan Goldberg, and uh, I'm a professor of practice and vice dean at Arizona State University. Uh, but what I've really been doing for the last 45 years is being a journalist most recently as editor-in-chief of National Geographic. So I am so excited to have this great panel today to talk about a really important conversation, which is about the living laboratories that are our national parks and protected places and how they can help with the climate crisis that we're undergoing. So let me just tell you who's up on the stage here with me. Then we're gonna let each of them speak very briefly, even more briefly than before, because we have a bit of a, a truncated period. And then we're just gonna have a conversation. And I am even gonna work in some time for uh, audience questions. So immediately next to me is Will Cuthrath, excuse me, Will Shafroth, I apologize, who is the president and CEO of the National Parks Foundation. Uh, the NPF uh, supports programs in national parks that conserve wildlife, uh, preserve our history, and inspire the next generation. Next to Will is Ai Ling. Ai Ling is a senior vice president for the Trust for Public Land, uh, which works to raise awareness and of the power of parks to fight climate change and also to close the outdoor equity gap. And I hope we're gonna talk a lot about that on this panel. Next to Ai Ling is Pedro Ramos. Pedro is the superintendent for all of the national parks here in South Florida, including the Everglades, the Dry Tortugas, and in fact, 2.5 million acres of land and waters fall under his supervision. And last but certainly not least is uh, Reverend Houston Cypress. Um, <laughs> yes, with, with, a, with an audience, um, who is a poet, artist, and environmental activist, and ordained minister who acts as a cultural ambassador for tribal clans and works to preserve uh, cultural heritage. So, Will, why don't we start off very briefly with you addressing how you think that these natural spaces can help us with climate change. Great. Thank you, Susan, and uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Before I do that, I'm going to do my Nancy Pelosi imitation just oh, for a no, second. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Everybody loves national parks, right? And I always want to do a quick poll. Who's been to a national park in the last year? See, Susan, this is great. So we all love them. They are, our, you know, in a lot of ways, our physical manifestation of our democracy. And that we all own these places. And in a way that we're all responsible for them. We're all responsible for making sure that they're, they're cared for. We have great people like Pedro who are stewards on the ground, but we all have a role to play. And our organization is really about helping the parks be better and help the visitors experience be better in those places. And so among the things that we do in the, in the National Park Foundation is raise money to provide funding to do the kinds of resilience work that we begin to talk about earlier today, including a, a $5 million uh, program that we just launched uh, around connecting young people through this conservation service corps to, to do climate change related work, you know, get rid of invasive species, repair trails damaged by floods, uh, do scientific studies, plant trees, those kinds of things that are tangible ways in which we can uh, advance the work of climate change and make parks better. As, as Susan said, these are living laboratories. Um, national parks are our most protected lands in our country. They're, they're once designated as a national park, they're not going to be converted to anything else. It doesn't mean that external forces like sea level rise and uh, other elements of climate change won't affect them, but these places can serve as, as living laboratories, as ways in which we can track uh, what's going on and, and learn from that and share that information about how we um, are become more resilient, how we can adapt to climate change on other public lands and special places. And so um, that's a good opener for me, and on to the next one. Thank you, Eileen. Hi, hi, great, and, and thanks, Susan. I um, before I jump in, I wanted to just share regrets from Diane Regas. She was supposed to be here on this panel and couldn't be here. I know she was really excited to be part of this conversation. Um, you know, Susan mentioned the outdoor equity gap, and um, you know, as maybe sort of the polar opposite, how many of you have been to your local park? 
you know, especially in the last couple of years. I think it's what we've really come to learn is that people need access to the outdoors and they need it every day. And so as the Trust for Public Land has begun digging into this work, we have 50 years of history working with great organizations like the National Park Foundation, the National Parks, many local land trusts and, and organizations around the country. We've really understood that this recent last two and a half years around the pandemic has shown the great disparities and, 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 and the inequities that exist between people who have access to parks and who do not. And we know one of our priorities is really connecting people to all of the benefits and the joys of the outdoors. And so our mission is really tied to how do we close that outdoor equity gap? How do we make sure people who need access to the outdoors most uh, are able to benefit from it? Um, you know, some of our most storied, you know, uh, of, uh, you know, impacts across our last 50 years of, you know, we can touch on uh, Zion National Park, we can look at the Appalachian Trail, but we also have 5,000 parks across the country that we've um, been able to bring forward and connect people to outdoors in their very local neighborhoods. Um, and, and this is the kind of work that I think is quite important for us to tackle in the, in the months and years coming forward because we know those without access to a park are going to be hotter, they're going to um, experience more flooding, and they're gonna be less healthy. And so that's really where we're coming at this issue uh, at the Trust for Public Land. Thank you. Pedro, tell us a little bit about your well, connection Well, good afternoon, and, and thank you, Susan. And I will start by saying that we in the National Park Service have been benefactors of both TPL uh, and, of course, our greatest partner, the National Park Foundation. So it's great to be here on this panel with, with both of you and with you, Houston, and welcoming everybody to uh, Miami. The question has been asked, have you been to a national park? Have you been to Everglades, Big Cypress, Biscayne, or Dry Tortugas National Park? And I see some good amount of hands, and, and that's exciting. You have no idea how many times I go to events right here in Miami, and sometimes that show of hands is not as abundant as we see it here in this room today. It is a pleasure to be here uh, to talk about this, uh, this problem that we all face. We, we all have this in common. And uh, we're not gonna pack up and just walk away. Susan and I were just talking about that uh, unexpectedly on the sidewalk uh, as we all had to leave the building. Uh, there are many things that we can do. There are many things that we are doing, not just in these four amazing national parks and preserve uh, that amount to two and a half million acres uh, of lands <coughs> and waters of, of Florida and home to the Miccosukee and the Seminole people. There are many, many things that, that these places are demonstrating. Uh, the agency, uh, as well as our partners, that, that can be done to make these places resilient, which is, I think, the name of the game. Resiliency and making sure that, and you said this, we help people connect. The, the hearts and mind thing with these open spaces so that they can have that sense of responsibility that I think everybody in this room already has. Thank you. So Houston, tell us a little bit about preserving indigenous culture and indigenous practices in these parks. Cool, thank you, Shonabish. Um, Chihi Hojo, I lie. He's a big short to Miss Side. Chigata, Chigimoti Side, please. So good to see everybody here. Welcome to this beautiful place and feel free to get to know and fall in love with it. That's what I said in Mikasuki. And so um, I wear a couple different hats. I, I like to serve my community's environmental advisory committee. And in this capacity, we've been able to um, use um, really innovative scientific methods to um, see what's going on in the water, to see what's affecting the plants, and to put policies that are uh, not only restorative but regenerative in these places. So I really appreciate how the Miccosukee tribe is able to integrate not only the scientific knowledge but the traditional knowledge um, in all of the reports that they put out. And so I think that um, that's something that I'd like to um, bring attention to in other ways as well through the nonprofit that I have. And through this nonprofit, we want to show what it is to be in solidarity with the local indigenous communities. And for me, in practice, that means making the Miccosukee priorities the priorities of our nonprofit. Um, so overall, I, I'm really hopeful that these places, the national parks, 
these protected areas can be a site of reconciliation. Not only do we need to reconnect um, with these places, the natural places, like on a personal relationship, but these places can also help us heal our own community's divisions, especially when you think back about the history of the park. Uh, these places were created by removing the indigenous people from their homelands to make visitors such as yourself feel welcome. So I'm really looking forward to this place as um, places where we can experiment with convening people and experiment with um, healing our relationships and seeing what we can do to share the joys of our gardens with one another. Not only the veggies and things, but the beautiful values that we're cultivating as communities. So those are the kind of things that bring me hope, and that's what I advocate for, not only with the Mikasuki side, but also to the nonprofit work that I'm involved in. Thank you, Houston. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, uh, for your comments. Let's just dive in. And you know, Pedro, I wanted to start uh, with you. What are some of the ways that the National Park Service, which for the first time, I might add, has a, a Native American um, Secretary of the Interior for the first time. I think also the the person running the Park Service I itself, both both are, are Native American. What are some of the ways that the Park Service is sort of grappling with this conversation about preserving both cultural heritage as well as cultural methods of land stewardship? Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad, Susan, that you're mentioning that we have the first Native American cabinet member leading us in Washington, D.C. right now. That is very significant, as well as Chuck Sams, who is the first Native American director of the National Park Service. He's been down here, met with the Mekosuke, and uh, is, is already setting us in the right path when it comes to uh, figuring out how to best use traditional knowledge and incorporate it into everything that we do. But, you know, generally speaking, uh, I, I like to I like to talk about three things usually when, when I speak about what we're doing about this problem that we all have. Making the, the environment more resilient, but also making sure that as we protect and preserve cultural resources that we have throughout our nation, including Fort Jefferson out in Dry Tortugas, that we think about how best to, to do it in a way that is sustainable over time. So we're focusing in doing that work. We're also focusing on making sure that people, we spoke about that already in our opening remarks, people need to continue having a connection with these places. So we need to uh, maintain and, and keep facilities that are sustainable, that are compatible with what is happening. And in the National Park Service, we're giving that a lot of thought and we're being very smart in the way that uh, we construct things nowadays, it, where we construct them, how we construct them, how we're going to use them in a manner that is compatible with all of these challenges that we're facing. And lastly, making sure that we take, we use our stage, right? The National Park Service hosts hundreds of millions of people in this 420 national park units that we have sprinkled throughout the country. We have a tremendous opportunity to help people understand how they can play a role in being part of the solution. Thank you. You know, you mentioned hearts and minds, and I do think that is such a key to, um, you know, I, I learned at National Geographic, you can't just give people science lectures about, um, you know, about, about the climate crisis. You've really got to touch them uh, or they won't care. So I think a lot about national parks and this next generation and how do we get the next generation to put down their devices and get off into a national park so they can really appreciate what there is to protect. And so what, are, what is your organization doing about that, Will? It's a great question and, and sort of transitioning from what Pedro said, I think it's, it's, he talks about 330 million people come to the National Parks every year. That's more than all of the professional sports combined every year. It's a huge number of people that come to the parks. And when they're there, and this is getting to your point, Susan, is that they, they, they have become kind of open-hearted. They're connected to the, to the outdoors. They're connected to the history and culture. And, and, and so when they're in that space, to, to be able to kind of share with them these serious challenges around climate change, around you know, uh, traditional ind indigenous communities who, that live there and having them come to an appreciation about those things are critically important. So 
you know, one of the things that we do for the park service is just plus up a lot of the programs around education and youth engagement. And so we, we have a, an effort that we call Open Outdoors for Kids where we're focusing on Title I fourth graders around the country to, to have, have them have field trips. Many of these kids will have never been to a national park. And so wherever they are, they're probably within an hour of a park. We bus them out there. We give them a lunch. We give them great educational experiences there in the park to give them kind of a gateway experience. And in turn, their families are able to, because they're fourth graders, they get a free pass to every national park in the country. And so we, we hopefully open that door for broader engagement. I mentioned the service corps is another thing that tends to be 16 to 25 year olds. And we do a lot of work with citizen science that's also trying to connect young people with science and, and therefore the opportunities that they have to do that science in parks. So Eileen, your organization did a great study that just came out earlier this month. You looked at parks in the 100 biggest cities, I think, and their connection yes. to the community. Can you tell people a little bit about that and what you found? Because I do think it hits at this environmental justice angle that we were talking about, about accessibility to the parks. Not everybody can get to Yellowstone and Yosemite and you know, all of it. A absolutely, absolutely. It's kind of fun sitting on this side of Will. It's sort of one end of the spectrum with these iconic, incredible places that, you know, we have, we still have the benefit to be able to go to and enjoy. And then there is the other end of the spectrum where, um, I don't know about you all, but I, I need a little nature in my life every day. And whether we are standing outside in a fire drill under a tree and getting some shade, um, or being able to go to um, your local park and have a nice experience, um, the joy and the actual benefits to people are pretty important. We've been studying this for quite some time at Trust for Public Land. The, the study that Susan was referencing is called uh, Park Score. We look at the 100 largest cities in the United States and we um, measure them on a number of factors and, uh, deter and, and better understand how they're moving the needle on creating access to parks for the people in their city. Um, we set a goal for ourselves in urban environments of putting everyone within a 10 minute walk of a park. Think of that as sort of a maybe a half mile walk. Um, within a 10 minute walk of a park, we have found that a, a, a park can cool a community six degrees within a 10 minute walk of a park. Um, we find that that's the 20 minutes a day of walking to and from a park and then maybe enjoying that space. So there's a number of benefits. I could go on and on. But this park score provides the park managers um, the information that they need to see how they're performing against many of the other uh, cities across the nation. One thing that we found is that 85, per, 85 of the top 100 cities are actually doing a lot to, on climate resilience in their communities communities, um, significantly up from where they have been over the last year. And so this is a trend that we're seeing. These, uh, these communities are really trying to invest in their park systems and the way that they're using their parks to, to capture stormwater, to deal with heat, and all of these issues, while they're also trying to provide some healthy recreational options for their communities. So it's, um, it's been a great um, resource for us to be able to help professionals who are in the space and also those who want more parks in their communities to be able to use this information to go and say, look, here's where we are, here's where we rank this year, um, and, and really help those folks be able to make the case to get more funding to support their needs. I do think it's so important because that to talk about the very local level because often I think that the role that cities and communities have in this conversation gets left out. You know, you've got, you know, we're, we were t talking last night with a speaker uh, about um, it, the role of the federal government and what can be done at a federal level, and it seems like not actually that much right now, but it's at the local level where we're seeing so much action. In Houston, so that, that brings me to you. You were talking before about the idea of reconciliation. How does that play out um, just on, on your average weekday, right, in the work that you do and with the, with the parks here? I don't, I don't think that reconciliation is discussed enough in terms of um, environmental restoration efforts, especially locally when, it, when we're talking about Everglades matters. But um, there's definitely um, long-standing agreements between indigenous sovereignties and the federal government that can be upheld that we can rely on to, um, to strengthen our arguments for conservation policies and things like that. But um, <clears throat> thinking about reconciliation also means that we have to reckon with um, some of the tragedies as well as the triumphs of the historical record 
And I was really happy that Cheyenne Kippenberger addressed those, um, that historical record in the land acknowledgement last night. So thinking about um, reconciliation and environmental justice in general, like check in with our indigenous hosts here just down the street, the Miccosukee and Seminole tribe. They definitely have a lot of critiques when it comes to the restoration process, but um, they've also set the standard for so much of the environmental goals that we're uh, trying to achieve here locally. So um, reconciliation for me is about um, not only the beautiful words that come at the, at the land acknowledgement, but what we can do to make those actionable. And so it definitely means um, listening to what the indigenous scientists are talking about um, and definitely respecting how the elders are guiding that scientific work. <clears throat> and I think it also has to do with showing up when people ask for support. Um, on a broader level, we can see that the last year, I think it was the Environmental Indigenous, the Indigenous Environmental Network published a report saying that by supporting indigenous-led direct actions, you're cutting down like 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions of US and Canada combined. So showing up for our indigenous hosts and our indigenous neighbors definitely has um, positive benefits here when we're talking about environmental and climate change concerns. You know, one of the things that I think all storytellers really struggle with is how do you talk about the climate crisis so that it doesn't just make people want to run screaming from the room, that they don't get so depressed or so overwhelmed or feel so helpless. And I think that each of you in your roles do play a role in the messaging around the climate change or climate crisis, whichever you want to call it, and what can be done about it. And I would love to just go up down this line here and tell me, how are you handling the messaging around this at the National Parks Foundation? It's, it's a great question, and because it's you know a, a part of our role is is around messaging and storytelling, and, and some of the things that Houston has just acknowledged is we're trying to help plus that up, whether it be on the civil rights movement or the stories around Japanese American internment camps, or around climate change. These are all very delicate things, and I, I would say one of the greatest things about the national parks is they just tell the truth. I mean, there's no pulling punches. It's not like well we you know because we're in this administration we can't talk about this. They just talk about it straight up, and I think that that's what people kind of expect when they come to the parks. I think, like I said earlier, they, they, they come to the places and they're affected at a very emotional level. And so I think it's, it's our moment to talk to them about kind of what they can do um, to, to affect it. So, you know, we're, we're helping them install water filling stations so they don't bring, you know, disposable plastic bottles into the parks. We can talk about scientific processes, and so they understand Glacier National Park in 20 years will have no glaciers. And the reason for that is that increasing temperatures and, you know, the albedo of the snow, all those kinds of things. So that we, we're trying to, to do that through the rangers, through the programming, all the things that happen in a park so that we can lean into this moment in a more effective way. Thank you, Eileen. Sure. You know, one of the, um, I would say, the, the great joys and inspiring parts of being at Trust for Public Land is being able to hear directly from the many communities where we're working. And it's been incredible. You know, we've worked with 70 tribes um, over, over our time to return or protect 200,000 acres of, of land um, to, uh, to, to native management. Um, we've been able to identify where there are communities where there are, are it's park desert, and being able to go into the schools and hear the stories of how the lack of green spaces are directly impacting the education, the health, the social cohesion of a community. Actually, and creating a platform you, there. You told me about a something this morning. I thought it was so moving. Will you tell other people about sure, this story? Sure, sure. I, I was sharing with Susan this morning that um, I had the opportunity to go to one of our community schoolyards. Uh, it, at the time, it was not one of our programs. We were, I was going with uh, Carrie Simmons, one of my project leaders, um, to a school in Tacoma. And um, what's fascinating about this, this elementary school, it's Jenny Reed Elementary School in Tacoma, Washington. It sits at this intricate interchange. Um, there's probably a stack of four highway, uh, four highways going up and above it. And the elementary school sits right in the middle of this interchange. And um, at one point, they were doing some work on the highways, and the school came, uh, the, the Department of Transportation came and clear cut some old growth trees. And this school became a kind of a bathtub of all the wastewater, stormwater coming off the highway system. And we went there to go meet with this teacher. Someone had connected um, Carrie and, um, 
and Abigail Sloan is principal's name, and said, you two should talk. You know, you, you all are doing similar things. And it was incredibly um, moving. I went in there, we sat down, and we, you know, we all have our maps. <laughs> we sat down and had our little map with little red blobs and green blobs and um, in sort of pointing and saying, hey, here's an area, you know, this, this community is sort of in a park desert. And Abby looked at that and she pointed out and she said, I'm tired of seeing red. She's, and she pointed up at her wall and, you know, in education, it's the red scores, you know, it's bad. She says, I'm tired of seeing red in my children's scores. I'm tired of seeing red on these maps. She said, when you give a child a broken schoolyard, hot asphalt, um, no grass, no place to play, and it's hot, you tell them they don't matter. And when you tell them they don't matter over and over and no one cares, you're setting yourself up. And she said, I'm tired of it. And what can you do about that? And, and it's, the, it's the element that's been driving our community schoolyards work, where we know we can go in at that very early age and have a direct impact on telling people they matter, at understanding what a community needs. And these, pro, the, these different schoolyards not only become a resource for the children at school, but we involve the entire community around it to say, what do they need most? What do they desire to have in their community? And pull their voices in, and then we work alongside them to bring that to, to, to fruition. And that is such a, that's such a powerful story about, about messaging and the messages that we send. So you know, the messages from the national parks themselves have not always been wildly welcoming, right? And it, you know, when I was growing up, there was a, I don't know, it was all like Yogi the Bear and, you know, the forest fire guy and uh, you know it was all you do have to be careful with you that. do have to be careful i know you don't want to <laughs> but how has the messaging in the parks themselves really changed to so, address this yeah you know i uh, when i heard you put the question out there the first thing that came to mind was it is not about gloom and doom it, it can't be uh i have the privilege to work in four really special places down here in South Florida. And I take every opportunity when I can to interact with our visitors. And when our visitors are out and about in the parks, whether down here or anywhere else in the country, they are in a, in a state of mind where they typically feel very inspired. It, they're just in that zone. And so knowing that, uh, I, I think that the thing that we, the way that we present this problem of climate change, sea level rise, is with a message of hope and action. Uh, there is something that we can do, and, and here it is how we are restoring America's Everglades, because it's not just the right thing, but because our livelihood down here in South Florida depends on it. One so, out of every four Floridians drinks water from the Everglades, and the economy of Florida depends on these places being strong and resilient. So, you know, it's, it's about putting the message out there in a way that people can relate yeah. a, and, 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 and perhaps even potentially present an opportunity for them to so participate. Do you, uh, that's what I was just gonna ask, do you give people, you know, if you go visit Everglades National Park, do you give people, here are, you know, here are things you can do to make a difference, or here are things, don't do this, do this instead? So, you know, talking about uh, it in terms of uh, the, the, the name of this session right here, yeah. we are a laboratory, and the, the ecosystem restoration work that we're doing down here in South Florida has never been tried anywhere in the world. This is the largest ecosystem landscape-wide restoration effort in the history of the world. And so we talk about what we're doing and, and we speak about how nature, when you are kind to her, she responds. And we're seeing it with rookeries of birds, for instance, that we have not seen in 80 years coming back to the glades because we are doing the right thing by mama nature and she's responding accordingly. So those are the messages that, that, we, that we speak with our visitors about. This is what we're doing. This is why we're constructing a facility like this with those types of materials because we're trying to be responsible and also present potentially an opportunity for you to think about how you may build your next house. And you know, 
this this business of of connecting with people it has a lot to do with being able to speak different languages and I, I was speaking with a young person this morning about this and I'm not talking Spanish or English I'm speaking about different ways that people may relate and and in Everglades National Park we're doing it in part through the arts and it, it is just paying incredible dividends We've got an organization that is helping us with it. And, and, and so when you start opening your mind to connecting with people in, in different ways, in ways that they can relate with you, then people respond to it. Uh, I did think yeah. that was one of the interesting things that the, the speaker mentioned last night. She mentioned specifically reaching people through the arts around the subject of climate change, right? Not lectures, not papers, not, you know, not a bunch of science at them, but, but touching, touching them. So yeah. Houston, how, how do we message this and how does that change? Well, I mean, um, I'm really appreciating how the arts can bring communities together to share knowledge and experience. And when I look at the arts, whether it's uh, a dance or a song or this beautiful message that you bring, I think if you look at it from um, the, the perspective of maybe like my community, the Mekisuki tribe, all of those activities are integrated as a spiritual practice. So I think like being open to the arts has a potential to create like um, multi-faith or different kinds of community coalitions. And I think that's when um, like uh, me and my friends have been most successful um, in advocating for the Everglades because there's been projects that have brought um, multiple communities together just to help us get access to the back country of the Everglades or to isolated places in Big Cypress because our new friends in these areas were able to help us get access. So that's what I really appreciate about like socially engaged art projects because it brings communities together. And I also liked how artists can um, show us an imaginative way forward that, um, that, that respects all these different knowledge systems um, because so much of um, uh, the kinds of information that we put forward in this kind of discussion might be put aside as like anecdotal or observation, but those are the kinds of real world insights that indigenous people and others um, are bringing to the table and those need to be respected just as much as other knowledge systems are. So I think the arts are a great way of bringing people together and inspiring action. Like that's been when we've really been most successful as an organization, as a nonprofit, the Love the Everglades movement, um, bringing an artist community or bringing um, artistic strategies to the direct action, to the Big Cypress, to um, the county courthouse and things like that. It's what we call a colorful ruckus. Hey, Susan, I, I just have to put the plug out there for Ari, the Artist in Residence yes, program in the Everglades. It, it is a remarkable program that has, they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. And, you know, it was 20 years ago, it was an idea to bring artists to these places so that they can create and share it through their art. And uh, this year, they're doing a really cool thing as part of their 20th anniversary and the Everglades National Park's 75th anniversary. It was in 1947 that President Truman dedicated Everglades to all of us. Aerie has decided that this year they wanted to make sure that there was diversity in the house and there's going to be a diverse artist every single month of the year that is getting a scholarship to stay in the park for 30 days, create their art, and the collection of art that we are developing with Ari is just unbelievable, really unbelievable. And it, it's speaking to people in ways that, that we can't in this uniform, but in ways that are also very meaningful. Well, and I'm yeah, glad. I, I really appreciate what Ari's doing, so I, I definitely back that up. And we, there, there's a, a really amazing artist that's going to be coming in June that represents an Afro-Indigenous background from the Tuscarora Nation, uh, a two-spirit artist by the name of Carmen Lane. So check them out. But yeah, Aries doing great work. I love them. That That is a good plug. And I want everybody to just put on their thinking caps out here. We've got, um, I can't read that sign you've just held up. <laughs> How many minutes? It looks like 10. It looks like 15. 
I'm is about to do that. Thank you very much. We're gonna, I'm glad this is an informal family gathering here. So, because that was not very professional of me. I can't read your sign. Um, so we are gonna move to Q&A. And, and so ever, as everybody is thinking here real quick, just what, I just want a brass tacks way. What can regular people to do to help this? You know, from, the, from your perspective, real quick, like lightning round here, and then we're gonna move to Q&A. We are the national organization, but there are 250 local organizations that represent individual parks and many other groups like the Trust for Public Land. So get to know an organization that resonates with you, volunteer, contribute, sign up to do something. Thank you. I like. I'm going to say something very simple. Take someone who hasn't been in the outdoors, get someone out. You will change their lives, and that will be, bring more people into this space who care about what we do and what we need to have done. Everybody does it differently, but what I will say is children, children, children. We're in this for the long term, and, and we got to be thoughtful about how we bring them out and how we allow them the opportunity, even at a young age, to participate. Terrific. Yeah, I would recommend two things. Visit these natural places, fall in love with them. And then the second one, support um, tribal governments because tribal governments are a powerful way of holding the state and the federal government accountable. Okay, now we've got some time for some questions from the audience and if I can, we've got a hand up right here. And if you could just introduce yourself, that would be terrific. Thanks, my name is Olivia and I work for the Clio Institute, a nonprofit Ooh. that does climate education um, in Florida. I have a question for Reverend Houston, how do we support tribal governments? When you say that, what does that mean, and how can people do that? Okay, cool, thank you. So um, the local indigenous um, communities are Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida and the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and they both um, advocate uh, locally at a state level and also federally for um, the Everglades or Big Cypress. So feel free to call them up directly and find out what their environmental priorities are and what their science departments are working on. Um, that's one direct way to do that. And also there's a, a number of events that um, the tribal governments hold, whether they're festivals, um, support their events, and then support their institutions like their museums and, and their local businesses as well. Okay, other questions? We've got a hand up over here, here, and here. And there. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for the panel. Uh, my name is Daniel Padillo Ochoa. I work with Ocean Conservancy here locally in Florida and Miami specifically. Um, I'm actually wondering how have like parks and protected areas, be it in indigenous land, be it in the national parks, how have they actually helped to combat some of the climate um, phenomena that we're experiencing? We can talk about sea level rise, we can talk about saltwater intrusion, but interpret it as openly as you would like to. Um, and I, I'm curious about the specific solutions. Happy to talk about that. Thanks for the question. So, you know, here, here in Florida, uh, we're very flat. The environment, uh, you know, has been, uh, particularly down here in South Florida, in permanent drought. And that has caused the elevation of the soil to actually drop. That's not good. You don't have to be a scientist to understand that as the seas are rising, you don't want your elevation and an already flat environment to be dropping. And uh, we have understood that very well. And one of the things that, that we're doing is not only monitoring so that we can understand what is happening and the levels of seawater encroachment onto freshwater marshes, but we are uh, pushing as much water as we can through Everglades restoration southward out to those estuaries because the estuaries need the fresh water. But that water that we're pushing from the lake out to the southern part of the peninsula is also acting as a way to counter some of the effects of sea level rise. That's, you know, that's an example that I have. The other is exotic species. You know, exotic species of animals and plants are taking advantage of the fact that the climate has been changing. And, you know, Will has spoken about uh, how they have been helping us uh, throughout the country in many different ways. One of the ways that they helped us in partnership with a private company, can I say the name, of uh, with the Publix, we all shop Publix around here in South Florida. And in partnership with Publix, uh, Will and the National Park Foundation granted us a significant amount of money for us to 
tackle the problem of exotic vegetation in a, in a very exposed coastal area of the southern tip of the Florida Peninsula inside of Everglades National Park, we could have not done that without the help of our partners. So making the place more resilient through exotic uh, removal and also restoring the natural flows of water that these massive wetlands need needs is the name of the game. Those yeah, are like great I'd like to offer something really quick in terms of specifics along the lines of what you're saying. Take an aerial perspective of these places and it'll, the land itself will show you how things used to flow because so much of the critique of Miccosukee Tribe is that a lot of these restoration processes are going against the natural flows. So just look at the land, see how the water used to flow, and then support those natural cycles because as simple as it sounds, the political process and the bureaucratic process can um, promote alternatives that are not that. So just look at the land itself and see what it used to be. Well, you want to get in, in a here. similar vein in Cape Cod National Seashore, there is a series of dikes and other artificial ways in which we we we've altered the environment there. And what we're doing in partnership with the Park Service is to take down that old infrastructure and restore the national systems. Um, for the locals, interestingly enough, we heard about this yesterday. It's it's a mosquito reduction result that will really motivate the local residents because the the saltwater mosquitoes are a lot worse than the freshwater mosquitoes, as it turns out. And so we are going to restore the systems. It's going to make that whole area much more resilient to sea level rise. Terrific. Susan, if I could, I, I just would like to offer sort of a another very specific way in which parks are helping. Atlanta um, has an area called Vine City that has continued to flood historically. And back in 2002, the city actually moved, had to move its residents out, had these massive storm, storm situations. And um, in this area, it's a historically black community, um, low income, and uh, we just completed a park there called Cook Park. It's a 16 acre park in the middle of the city. Within that park, we've created a two acre retention pond. So it is now capturing all the storm water and filtering it and putting it back into the system. This has allowed residents to move back into the community um, and reduce the impacts of um, flooding that had been historically impacting that community. These, these are great examples and very uh, encouraging in an often discouraging conversation. I saw some hands over here. Thank you. My name is Dylan Shehey from the Pueblo of Zia. I'm a tribal councilman. I'm also with the National Congress of American Indians, specializing in government relations. And uh, thank you for, for this presentation. Um, public lands, national parks encompass many of the sacred and traditional lands of tribal nations. However, current federal land management laws do not protect tribal interests of traditional rights. How are you and your colleagues working, advocating to provide parity for tribal governments in federal land management and to protect tribal traditional and cultural interests in federal lands? What are your organizations doing to incorporate indigenous voices from our tribal traditional leaders as we have been stewards of these lands since time immemorial? We hold thousands of years of indigenous traditional ecolog ecological knowledge. Uha, thank you. Thank you for that question. Will, uh, may I start with you on that? Sure, sure. Um, and I'm, I know Peter will have something to say about that too. I know that the new director of the Park Service is, <clears throat> has launched a, a, a formal way of, for tribal consultation with the National Park Service, and I think Secretary Holland is doing the same thing so in a pretty specific way to, to make sure that those voices are more included in our public lands management decisions. For our part as a nonprofit, we're, we're trying to help the Park Service accelerate the integration of the traditional stories into the national parks. There's 423 national park sites all over the country, and each of them is on indigenous land. And, and so to, to not just acknowledge that that was there, but to understand uh, the traditions and, and the, the, the ways of the indigenous peoples in those places as a way to educate our citizens who visit these. 330 million visitors can learn a lot about indigenous, indigenous cultures through the Park Service. So, as we said earlier, we are very, very lucky to have Secretary Halland and Chuck Sams as the director of the National Park Service coming in with a, an agenda that is very a, ambitious that we're all working towards already to make sure that we honor American Indian sovereignty and that we incorporate 
traditional knowledge into our decision-making processes. Down here in South Florida, in particular, Big Cypress National Preserve, I don't know if you've had a chance to visit it. It's a fairly large footprint of land. Houston Cypress calls that place home, and it is his home. By law, thank goodness, Congress had the wisdom nearly 50 years ago to give the Mikasuki and the Seminole people the rights of use and occupancy. So I am one of those very lucky superintendents uh, from out of uh, 420 parks that does have some legal authorities that we take advantage of to make sure that we do right by the native, native people uh, down here in South Florida. The traditional knowledge piece, uh, you know, I, I will tell you that it's, it, it's a challenge because I understand the history and I understand how careful because of all of that history, Native people have to be sharing that traditional knowledge. And it comes down to trust. It comes down to trust and it comes down to listening. I personally have been down here 22 years and I think I have earned the trust of the Native people that I work with down here. And I am benefiting from the information that I have and it helps me make the best decisions possible, incorporating that information in a responsible way and a respectful way because sometimes Native American people do not want those traditional knowledges to be publicly known. And, uh, and so it, it is complicated, but you know now that we have leadership in place that is making this a priority, I'm really excited about how we will programmatically work it into the consultation processes that we already have in place, both formally and informally. Thank you. I think we've got time for maybe one and a half more questions, depending on them. We've got a hand right there. Good, a good afternoon, S Stephen Leitner. Mr. Ramos, Biscayne National Park, the Florida Reef Track runs, a significant part of the Reef Track runs through Biscayne National Park. At some point, their management plan called for limiting access to areas of the Reef Track in order to stop degradation. That process seems to have stopped the protecting, uh, protecting the marine reserves in Biscayne National Park or marine preserves. Uh, could you let us know where that process is? So you're talking about the general management plan for Biscayne National Park, which was completed about five, six years ago. Correct. And part of that plan called for a, a, an area that would be close to, to fishing. And what we have been doing is working with our partners in the state of Florida to uh, implement fishing practices that are sustainable and monitoring so that we can better understand the problem that we have seen with the bay. Uh, the problem in the bay uh, is very complex, as you know. I think that you're from down here and you understand all of the complexities of making sure that Biscayne Bay and Biscayne National Park in particular will be healthy in the long term. And one of those problems is water. So we're, we're tackling it from both sides. We are making sure that we are having fisheries and fishing activities that are sustainable, but at the same time, we're focusing on making sure that Biscayne gets the water that, that it requires in order to be healthy in the long term. I think that that is all that we do have time for today, I'm afraid. I'm Trying, I'm being very <laughs> mindful, um, but I want to thank our terrific panel, Will, Eileen, Pedro, Houston, thank you, and thank you for shedding so much light on the key role, really, that parks, big or small, are playing in climate solutions. Thanks to the audience. Good afternoon. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you.